welcome to another episode where I diverge from my usual discussions about music and music albums. So far, when I've done booktube videos, I've only done children's books, and with one exception, all children's books within one series, but I do read plenty of other stuff. Uh, and this is something I read recently that I thought would be fun to talk about. It's called The Age of Improv by Rick Salutin. I think that's how you say his name. So Rick Salutin is a columnist for the Toronto Star, one of the main daily newspapers in Toronto, which I've been reading cover to cover, at least the news section, the past year and a half. And Rick Salutin is one of the few columnists that really connect with me, I guess, because we have fairly similar political ideologies. But I guess the other thing is I started reading the newspaper because when I was just getting my news from the internet, I disproportionately just listened to American federal politics kind of podcasts, and I didn't get enough sense of Toronto local culture. But I feel like one of the frustrations with sort of coverage that tries to be more local is that it just kinds of, it kind of guesses what the relevant local issues are, and sometimes it feels like the paper ends up harping on and on on very silly local or small scale issues that don't deserve to be the only thing covered. And also you see a more limited range of opinions. And while the Toronto Star is generally left of center, it tends to be left in a sort of very institutional, you know, support the, the Liberal Party kind of way. Whereas Rick Salutin is one of the few people who writes for the magazine that seems to have a left of the Liberal Party perspective, uh, along with Thomas Wacom, who he shares a, a page with when he writes on Thursdays, and as well as occasional columnist Linda McQuake. But this book, The Age of Improv, which he wrote back in the 90s, is a novel. It, it tells a fictional story while also giving a snapshot of presumably how Rick Salutin perceived Canadian politics at that moment in history. Right off the bat, I should say what the negative with this book is, because I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to any person on the street. I found it enjoyable reading as someone who enjoys Rick Salutin's political column and, you know, possibly other people who live in Canada and identify as part of the political left, they might find some serious interest in this book. What I did find about it is it kind of reminded me of my experience of when I read a novel by Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen, of course, a great songwriter, a great poet, and it sort of felt like when he tried to write a novel, he was trying to get all these feelings, all these images into it, and he sort of prioritized getting all those feelings and images onto the page over telling a completely coherent story. And at times, maybe it was, you know, style to be a bit hard to follow, but, you know, it prevented my ability to enjoy his novel that much. Rick Salutin's writing isn't as convoluted or abstract as Leonard Cohen's, but it felt like a similar thing. He had ideas and images he wanted to share, and he wrote them in this novel, regardless of whether he had a plot in place. Uh, and while I found sort of like the core idea of the plot of this book easy to follow, and while I kept track of who two of the characters were, I felt like with the other characters in the book, I had a bit of trouble remembering who they were, and it also felt like the book didn't really have a plot. It felt like it had a mini plot in the middle, but the beginning and end were, you know, comparatively anticlimactic. Now, that said, there are kind of structural reasons within this book that justify it. So what's its premise? What makes it the age of improv? Well, clearly Rick Salutin seems to have an interest in improvisational theater, uh, in theater in general, along with politics. Uh, and he's talking about 90s culture where he and a lot of people on the political left are feeling disillusioned. You know, there are no longer self-identified socialist countries anymore. It feels like there's not a socialist labor movement in North America anymore. And while there is a social democratic party in Canada, the NDP, Salutin and Canadian voters in general don't feel very inspired by them. And there's not really a clear difference between their brand of social democracy and the centrist neoliberalism of the Liberal Party. They don't stand for hard and coherent socialist positions. Now, where Salutin tries to find hope uh, is, at least in the semi-fictional world of this novel, just as the sort of big ideology of socialism is kind of taken a nosedive, 
so too he kind of imagines have the opposite ideology. So just because socialism isn't doing well, it doesn't mean people are hardcore believers in the liberal party or the conservative party or in capitalism or neoliberal capitalism or, what, or whatever. He kind of views this sort of 90s onward political culture as one devoid of anyone having strong ideological identity. And as such, the premise of this book is that Matthew Deans, a Canadian actor with broadly leftist socialist politics might be able to sort of sneak his way into power because no one really believes in enough of the other political parties. And as long as he doesn't call himself a socialist, he sort of, you know, just plays to his folksy beloved image and the sort of broad appeal of certain kinds of left-wing ideals, he can sneak his way into power. And the book follows various conversations between Matthew and his various friends. As I said, I could only keep track of one who he is. There's this professor named Morris, who's a more ideologically strict, hardline Marxist, who Matthew turns to guidance. But there are various other figures who come up, and I had a hard time keeping track of who they were. And I think the reason for this is they all seem to have similar left-wing political voices. And I feel like one of the things this book gets at is the phenomenon of political bubbles. Part of what it is to exist as a socialist, a, a Marxist in the world, is to go between feeling like everyone is socialist and Marxist, because that seems to be what's in vogue in artistic and cultural spaces. That's certainly what's expected of you in your own political spaces, while simultaneously realizing that no one is, because a Marxist or even a social democratic party can't get remotely close to political power. So what's kind of awkward about this book is it feels like all the characters kind of blend together because they're all within the protagonist Matthew Dean's broad world. And so they all have similar politics, all use same, the same references. And yet somehow this doesn't translate to the broader world having those politics. The other thing structurally about this book that means it kind of peters out is it's called The Age of Improv. It's about the idea of this actor improvising himself to political power. Uh, but the problem with improvs is unless you're an absolute improv, improv, improv genius, eventually you're going to run out of ideas. And, you know, I've seen fairly good sketch comedy shows, semi-professional, professional comedians. They'll do improv, and obviously they're a lot better than people who don't do it. But it's not like every single sketch they do is funny. So Matthew Deans becomes prime minister somehow, and then he hosts this referendum and the question of the referendum is something like, should society be based on solidarity? And the majority of people vote for it. And it's like this grand plan to sort of push the Canadian culture in a socialist direction. But after he has this referendum, the improv runs out of steam and he doesn't know what to do. And it feels like that's kind of because the author as well didn't know what to do. He could imagine the idea of an actor sneaking to political power with semi-Marxist ideas in Canada but Rick Salutin's imagination is not fully strong enough to improvise the rest of the revolution, to improvise a, a happy ending. So I feel like there's a lot of interesting bits and pieces here, lots of good lines, lots of good conversations, uh, lots of references to elements of Canadiana that I remember as someone who was born in the 90s, and I guess I had teachers who were not too much younger than Rick Salutin, you know, things like, you know, Ben Johnson winning and then being found to abuse steroids in the Olympics or Quebec separatism and the various ideologies that underline that. So it just feels like it's a snapshot of a moment and a snapshot of the confusion of being Marxist in a world which I imagine many millennials and Gen Z can relate to. It's very easy to go online and say, F capitalism, and it feels like all your friends agree with you. But then you read the news and the same old neoliberal political parties are in power. And it's just hard to imagine how one works out of it. So all one is to do is left with fantasizing that maybe, you know, one political hero like Matthew Deans, the actor, will come around and save you. Uh, so let me know if you have any other insights on this book. I believe Rick Salutin has written a few other novels. Maybe I'll check them out at some point. But for now, I'll mostly just enjoy reading his column once a week in the Toronto Star. I'll be back mostly with music reviews in the future, but if I read an interesting book like this going forward, I'll gladly let you know. Mm -hmm.